Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Henry. I'm from uh, Sensible4. Uh, what we do is uh, automated vehicles, and uh, actually, we don't want to do vehicles. We want to do software. We are a software company. We want to deliver level four autonomy in a sensible way. That's kind of a hint in the company name, Sensible4, to as many self-driving vehicle providers as possible, focusing on creating the software, integrating into it into as many vehicles as possible, and exactly what we were talking about, how can we eliminate the safety driver in the vehicle because of the problem that we have so many positions for truck drivers, buses, and all of that open in the world. It's a really problem. And, and one place that we've been in, in Japan, can anybody guess what the median age of a truck driver is in Japan? Close to it. What's the median age of a truck driver in Japan? Too high is the answer. The actual answer is 68. 60 is the median age of truck driver in Japan. And that kind of gives you a context for the problem on what we're solving in, in here and what we're trying to do. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we actually can then solve that problem in a scalable way and how we can actually do all of that validation, verification in a legislative, nice way that we can actually pu push through a lot of this stuff. But first, let me show you a little demo on what our software actually does. So as said, we are actually a software company. We don't want to be, in the end, delivering cars or anything like that. We want to deliver the software which actually puts us on the streets and actually helps other people build up all of their cars and automotive on that. We do the positioning and mapping. And actually, that video that you saw, you had all of the like Menthos steps shapes in there. That's actually the data and the way that our vehicles see. It's called NDT MCL mapping. We do those kind of Memphis shapes from surfaces, and that enables us to see what's actually happening. And we've won a lot of awards around this topic, and th I think that's a little bit about the company. So, uh, who am I? I'm Henry, hi. I have a background actually from biology side, so done a lot of uh, computational systems biology back in the day. Nowadays it's called machine learning and stuff like that. Also doing a little bit of PhD work around this topic. But one thing that I've been working a lot around in a lot of the companies that I've been is DevOps, startups, and for software quality. And focusing on how we can deliver software in as good of a quality as is needed. Not top quality, not bad quality, the quality that is needed. And I think this is now a major hurdle in automotive and in many of these regulated fields where we have a lot of regulations on how to do it and how can we actually do it scalably because we have a lot of manual validation steps and certification steps that take a lot of time that really don't scale. Uh, here's a problem. This is an email that I've ordered a car one and a half years ago, an electric car. It's getting hopefully delivered before midsummer. Let's see. But the point is that they are now saying to me, we actually cannot deliver it to you with the newest software version that we just released because we cannot integrate it back into the old vehicles that we have already delivered. So I'm actually getting a car which is already old, which I cannot update to the newest version, and somebody who's ordered the car now gets a better car than me, and I cannot get that with the, even though I never have actually received my car. This kind of software integration problems and software deployment problems are super common in the automotive side of the things. And this is, I think, the ma most major problem that's kind of stopping us from quickly deploying self-driving capabilities to a lot of places and actually iterating on the problem. Because for each software version, you have to go through all of the checks and all of validation and all of that. So how do we solve it? We go pretty much back to basics. This is the original waterfall software project white paper from like 1940. That's, that's, this has been the way that many companies 
to software. You first do system requirements, software requirements, then you analyze them, you design the program, you do the actual coding, and then you do the testing, and then you do the operations. The funny thing is, everybody's just open the paper, look at the picture, decide that, hey, implementation steps to develop a large computer program. That's what it says under the picture. Very good. Nobody read the second sentence from Fowler, which says, I believe in this concept, but the implementation described above is risky and invites failure. And this is the basis of all software development, pretty much, that we do in all large instances, in large corporations, in a lot of places. And we actually made it worse. We've actually introduced uh, multiple levels into the whole thing. We have one organization doing system requirements. They have uh, in only touch with the second organization who's doing the requirements. They have touch points with the other guys. There is no communication back and forth. You just do, do stuff, and then in the end, you have testing and validation. What if it fails in there? You have to do the whole pipeline again. Everything fails. You've lost a lot of time, and it's super slow on doing this. This is, this is the basics and governing all the backgrounds. Uh, and I think this is a quite nice example of what you can actually do when you start going into uh, outside of this box, not doing the kind of waterfall stuff, but doing it also around organizations. Looking at previously at this, this is kind of the OEM chain of how you deliver parts for your cars. You have Bosch or some other vendor delivering a pump according to spec, which is then integrated into the vehicle, and then you suddenly have 40, 50, 60 components in your vehicle, developed by different companies using different operational languages, coding languages, but they interoperate because of standards. But those standards are actually also a problem. Tesla in the last investor day, I think this is one of the ma most major slides from Tesla's investor day slide deck. They'd say it kind of casually, it was like 30 seconds of content in two hour stream, but this is what struck me the most. Yeah, we decided to switch from 12 volt software, uh, electric architecture to 48 volts because we saved 80 kilograms of car weight. I started thinking about this. This change would be impossible for the kind of uh, typical automotive player. Let's say uh, Audi decides to say to their whole organization, hey, guys, in, th in six months, we are going to change our electric architecture 48 volts. Not gonna happen because you have so low, or so long pipeline of projects coming in. You go to Bosch and say, hey, we actually changed this. In 12 months, you have to deliver 48 volts and not 12 volts. They're gonna say, hey, we have a 10 year contract with you guys to deliver this part in 12 volts. So it's not just the software thing, it's also the processes and interactions with other companies that's kind of slow and standardized because of around these kind of standards. So this is a problem in many places and I think this is gonna hit the German automotive industry really, really hard, that it's not just in, in uh, the components and all of that that's preventing fast innovation, it's in the contractual side, which makes it slow. And uh, as I said, this is a quite a big anti-pattern for the whole field. Uh, and uh, this kind of testing and verification models, this is again from the 1940s, the original white paper, some of you are kind of smiling. This, you go talk to any automotive or any people that this is, this is the first that have you integrated, are you doing everything up to spec, are you doing the V model, are you doing MISRA, are you doing ISO 26262 and all of this. And are you doing it according to the process or they are saying that this is a process. But V model is not a process, you don't go from one step or another. I think it's, more, it's something else but we'll come to back, back to that in a little while. And this is the original stuff that kind of even Fowler in his original paper he said that there's a lot of stuff around this, it's not going to be easy to do everything in the waterfallish way, but because this picture is complicated and difficult, nobody kind of wanted to look at it. So, what should we do about this whole problem? How do we enable, as said, self-driving, driverless, in a safe, safe way that we can automatically nicely verify and do it in a fast pace because we, we are gonna get changes from, this is a new field. Nobody knows how to do self-driving. There is no like guidebook that you can look into and say that these are the steps that I should follow, these are the steps I should validate to actually be able to make a self-driving car. Nobody knows. So you cannot do it the validation route. So how do you do it? And, and, and kind of paradoxically, I think we should look at, look at this not as a process, but as a checklist. Can we, from some point of our process or, or development, get, is there like a pointer in here? I don't know, I don't think so. Get all of the different documents that's needed for validation, that's needed for device recommend spec and unit model testing, system testing. Can we automatically generate all of this from the process that we are running on automatically, as basically nowadays the software companies just 
bunch of people with laptops. But if you start introducing some kind of process in there, then you suddenly start having something more than just guys with a laptop. So what we want is get all of this automatically delivered to whoever is a standardized organization, even in a day. We want to do a software, new software version every day, and then just deliver 10,000 documents to whoever wants to audit it. And if they want to read through that, go ahead. We are going to do a new version tomorrow. So we have to automate the whole pipeline, even on the re receiving end at some point. And, and kind of like the value stream that's happening in there, this is the same thing that you have a pipeline where you go through it. And again, in this one, I put the testing in the middle. I'm a testing guy, so testing is a good place to have up and front and the middle of the slide. But kind of the idea that if you want to build quality, you have to have it everywhere and not just do a validation at the end of it. Somebody gives me a software version, I check it through. That Does it go through the simulator? Does it go through that? No, no, no. You actually have to go both ways on the whole organization. You have to do what's called continuous testing, keyword-driven test automation, explore it, and non-functional. I'm not going to throw all of this. I'm just going to, this is a slide that I stole from another presentation. Of course, that's what people do. So the idea being that we go into the design phase. And even from there, nowadays, what we actually do is we do a lot of keyword-based or specific, all of our development is based on spec specifications, examples. Then those examples are a base, basis for simulators. There we actually run the same use case in the simulators after we've actually done the software, and then we can test that in the cars. If we do that in a systemic way, we always get a link from whatever the customer wanted, what we discussed. Given our car is driving 20 kilometers an hour in a pedestrian zone while ODD1 is in effect, then our vehicle should stop if a pedestrian walks to the front of the vehicle, and then the vehicle makes a minimum risk maneuver. I think that's pretty much close to an actual specification that we have somewhere in our system. That's, that's the basis of our development full workflow. And this goes through the whole system. You automate that, then the developer gets that one. You always link code changes to that bit of description that what should happen. The developer always knows that this is the end goal that I want to. And this, this happens in this phase, code analysis and all that. You automate all of this, generate all of the documents automatically, and then go into the actual vehicle deployment. This is also something that's a bit different and a bit difficult in legislative side now because of GDPR and a lot of other stuff. For example, we cannot record the data we get from cameras, for example, quite easily. There's a lot of red tape around getting uh, the recordings of every single test run, for example. We have Tesla has ways of going around that, which is kind of US style of way of doing things. But in the EU, we have, uh, we have a lot of GDPR, for example, blocking us on recording everything, which would be really good for testing, because then we would could actually, and we also do now, run simulators based on recorded stuff. And chaos engineering, just pull the plug on some, some sensor or virtually do it and see what happens. If something bad happens, then the design is failure. We, we, all, of, all of this is automated. All of it generates a lot of documentation, which we can, in the end, it, it then deliver to TÜV or somebody or other organization which does that. No, no one in our organization spends time generating documents for verification and validation. And this thing is going to get even more out of hand now with LLMs uh, and chat GPT and all of that. I've actually tested it. It works quite nicely in generating new test cases for our simulators in just building them up with the new chat GPT. Test coverage is going to be an interesting topic in the future. It's going to go away because we can just easily generate test scenarios for simulators with AI if we have everything else in a nice spot. And this is exactly the topic, that automated validation. We don't get somebody to come in, drive it, all of that. No, we take space from the cloud, run it on simulators, and generate everything automatically in the kind of two-phase mode. This is, I think, the bread and butter of what our company is about, not just the guys with laptops, our girls also. Two loops. One is constantly creating new versions of the software on the bottom. The input comes from the product feed need, that what we actually need in there. And we call this the V8 model. This is V from the V model that we had, and 8 from the kind of DevOps loop that we put on top of it. So hey, V8 engines, automotive, that's the name. So <coughs> continuously developing every night a new software version, which automatically then goes to the simulators and even to the hardware in the loop testing where we have lighters and everything being tested. And when we decide that, hey, we actually want to take this new version now into actual road usage, 
then we pr promote it from the bottom loop where our guys can just continuously improve on it without like considering spec or anything like that. At that point, we raise it to the top loop, take it into testing, actually deploy it into a vehicle, see if it works in a vehicle. If it doesn't, go back to the bottom loop, get a new version, or make it sick about bugs and all of that so that we can get the traceability again automated. You cannot start just coding in our company. You have to have uh, either a customer requirement or a bug that you're fixing, and that link is hard-coded. That means that all of the like requirements for MISRA and ISO and all of that is automatically done. Nobody needs to care about it. And that way, we can always deploy new versions, even daily, to our cars that we have. I said we are not a car company, but you saw you had the nice Pro Toyota Pro Aces. Yes, they're with diesel, but we also have electrics now. And then also we are now in uh, Japan operating heavy trucks. It's the same software. And that's what we want to do. We want to be kind of like the Android of the automotive self-driving world. We, we give out the platform and which can be then customized to a lot of different people. We don't want to compete with Tesla. We're going to lose. We don't want to compete with probably VAG or anybody else. <laughs> we want to provide the platform for that. And this V8 is the engine, how we can actually do that. Because in my opinion, the kind of producing something is all about the culture and the right tools to do it. And on the bottom loop, we always get something from the pipeline. We get the best tools. If you can, if, if you take tools that have APIs, you can link them together. If they don't, the world is full of RPA tools that can enable you to link tools that, that don't have APIs together. And now, if they don't have proper RPA support, then just use LLM and other tools to do the automation for you. Always automate as much as possible. And this enables to have always online auditability. Anybody can come in and check. Everything is in there. It takes up a lot of space in Amazon or whatever, but the history is there and nobody has to care about it. And we have the visibility to everything, which is actually very important as well, so we know what's going on in there. And on the top loop, as I said, again, AI enables us to do true agility in this. Generate a lot of test cases based on jerking, ba based on what the customer has said to us. Please summarize what the client actually wanted, then generate 10,000 Gherkin-based test scenarios from what the customer said in this meeting, and it's done. It's like magic. I, I've improved, I guess, my what is it, efficiency like 10 times just using a lot of AI tools nowadays. And again, makes everything easy, audits. Very nice. And I think this is the key thing, that we want to have the customer on the top loop, we want to have the software on the bottom loop, and automat automation between these helps with all of the friction between the, hey, the customer wanted a feature done next week, but we cannot deliver it that, but maybe in two weeks. But we still have it in the pipeline. We might have a version of it in which we can deploy quite fast. We really want to enable continuous validation through technology on automotive to actually do what, what is done in any software application as well. It doesn't matter if the hardware changes. It doesn't matter if the uh, software changes. The audits are there. The safety is there. And that's kind of, I think, our main point. To actually deliver a killing product, you have to have a killer pipeline and a killer validation for it, so it's safe. And I think that's my main point. I'm going to stop on that point. Thank you, everybody.